Okay. I welcome everybody uh, to the um, to the colloquium, and um, I just want to say that um, when I was a poor, humble postdoc slogging away in uh, Los Alamos in Texas, in a, it was like so miserable studying heavy irons because the um, intellectual snobbery of our uh, <laughs> anyway, so it's not we weren't so respectable. And then some people said we should try to make heavy irons respectable and actually put on a formal basis and, and actually do some real calculations. And Raju was one of these heroes who actually calculated something for us that was actually uh, had some respectability. So he worked uh, a great deal in the, in the theoretical underpinnings of our field and has been explaining that to our students. Um, so recently Raju has been part of the efforts to try to motivate the construction of an electron ion collider and explaining that within the context of the nuclear long-range plan, um, how we can sort of do a whole bunch of different physics. Um, Raju, Raju started at, uh, um, did your PhD at Stony Brook, right? right? And has been at Brookhaven since then, I believe. No, no. No, no, no Minnesota. That was, uh, yeah, Minnesota and other places. Yeah. Yes, a bunch of places, but now he's at Brookhaven, which is really sort of intellectual center for our, our field. And so um, Raj has been great for us today, um, teaching my class and really uh, helping us grasp how, to, in what re in certain what regions we can actually um, test QCD in a whole new dynamic range. And now he's going to talk to us about the new possibilities for another machine. So thank you, Raj. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do I, do I need a mic or is that, can you hear me at the back of the room? Can you hear me at the back? Okay. Yeah, so um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, you know, with this visit, I get to uh, check off another state on my, on my list. Uh, <laughs> the 50 United States, I have four more to go. So anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, I've been interacting with Michael and Daniel. Um, and even John, he doesn't remember, but uh, <laughs> in the past, uh, on, on, on several uh, several occasions, so it's really a pleasure to be here. So what I'm going to talk to you about is the uh, the physics behind an electron ion collider. So I should mention I'm not an X-ray physicist or an experimentalist, uh, just a humble theorist. And this is kind of my uh, idea why this physics is interesting. So um, fundamentally, it has to do with the structure of matter, uh, and this is an old quest, of course, going back centuries when. People use microscopes to, uh, to investigate what the structure of, of matter was, you know, cells, uh, and uh, what's, what's, uh, you know, what, what constitutes the structure of, of little particles, brown in motion, and so on. So this is, uh, this, these correspond to wavelengths about uh, hundreds of nanometers and resolutions about uh, 200 nanometers. So a nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters, if, if anyone might not know. Uh, and then, of course, that quest has gone on to sort of electron microscopes, which probe uh, matter at much smaller length scales. So this is 0.02 nanometers, and this resolution is about 0.2 nanometers. And, and the condensed matter community has gone even further. They've been going into the GV range even. So for example, at Brookhaven, we have a national superconducting, uh, uh, so sorry, the NSLS2 uh, facility, which has three GV electron beams to, to study properties of materials. Uh, however, the GV scale has previously been the domain of, of particle physicists, so there's been a long history uh, of doing uh, measurements where you collide electrons on, on fixed targets to understand what the structure of these fixed targets uh, are, and starting from the SLAC days, uh, there's the EMC experiments, NMC doing polarized targets, I-665, BCDMS, Hermes at, in, in Germany, uh, and JLab, of course, at uh, in Virginia, and Compass at CERN. Uh, there's a whole set of experiments over the last decades which have been studying various properties of matter at very, very, very small wavelengths. So this is wavelengths going down to 0.01 fermis and resolutions of about 0.1 femtometer. So a femtometer is 10 to the minus 15 meters. So very, very fine resolutions of the structure of matter. And now there's JLab 12GB. <coughs> Uh, which will be starting up soon. It's already started operations. So this is an upgrade of JLab, uh, which was a 6 GB machine. But now this is an upgrade at extremely high luminosities to study the, the structure of matter at the femto scale. Uh, however, there's, there's a sort of a big kit on the block, and those are 
those are electron ion collider machines. So here you have beams of electrons which collide in beams of hadrons. Uh, and the Uber facility for that was HERA, the Hadron Electron Ring Accelerator at DAISY, uh, where they went down to extremely fine wavelengths and resolutions. Uh, so it's, it, this is almost 10 to the minus 19 paramedes and wavelengths and resolutions, about 10 to the minus 18 paramedes. So very, very fine resolutions. Uh, and so we are talking now here, so what I'm here today to talk to you about is an electron ion collider project in the United States, uh, which is a similar accelerator uh, to the, that in Hera, but with some really unique and special features that make its physics very compelling. Uh, there's also a project at CERN, the LGC, um, where they want to do sort of a souped up version of Hera. And if I have a chance, I will talk briefly about that as well. So here's a science case for an EIC, and you can think of it as a, as a, as a play in, in, in four acts. Uh, there won't be any intermission, so no drinks uh, in the meantime. But uh, so this is divided into four parts, and they constitute first the what the essential mystery is about what we want to study, uh, and and then what what we know of, of what what you know what this mystery is all about, uh, and then then we would like to address you know what we would like to know about this mystery, what we'd like to uncover about it, and finally how to get there. So so my talk is divided into these four parts. So uh, just keep that in mind if at some point you lose the flow. So act one is the mysterious gluon. And many of you have probably seen this chart by now. Uh, this, this is a chart of the fundamental particles, quarks and leptons and fermions, uh, which make up matter. These are the force carriers, the gluons, the photons, which carry the electromagnetic force, uh, and the Z and W bosons, which are force carriers of the weak force electroweak force, and then this is the newest addition to the family of Higgs boson, as several of you know, was discovered at the LHC a couple of years ago. Um, but the story is really about the gluon, which is a particle which plays uh, uh, a much bigger role than, than, uh, than one would imagine. It sort of plays a very crucial role in tying all of this together, uh, even though it carries no mass, no charge, and So, um, so they are so gluons, which is the which are the primary subject of the story, are, are force carriers of a strong force, um, and thereby are 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 fundamental building block of any standard model. Now, um, any story of the gluon is to talk about how it was discovered, and it was discovered in E plus E minus collision. So electrons and positrons collided to annihilate into a virtual photon, which then Go into went into quark anti quark pairs. So such experiments were were done at uh, at Daisy in Germany with the uh, Petra uh, positron electron ring accelerator um, experiment. Uh, and um, what what so these as these uh, diagrams illustrate for the mo most part in such collisions they noticed that the stuff went into two jets of particles which one could identify as a quark sort of fragmenting and showering into various particles, which were then sort of measured in the, in the detectors there. Um, and, and, but then in a few events, you looked, you saw three jet events like this, where you could identify the third jet as being a gluon emitted by either the quark or the anti-quark. And so this gave sort of the first direct evidence for the existence of gluons. And so this plot here is actually from the LEF de de detector with the LEF experiment in, at CERN, which was done much later. Uh, the first events didn't have, didn't look as pretty. No, that they were done in 1980, so they didn't have uh, such fancy images then. But it was, they were obtained with Tasso detector at, at Petra. And so this gave really unambiguous evidence for the existence of gluon, which was still doubted. The existence of the gluon was still doubted by a number of people, and this sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, <coughs> uh, clinched the, the, the argument for the existence of gluon. Now, um, so what is it that's really special about gluons? So we know that if you, if you, if you look at the mass of matter, <coughs> so what makes up the proton, for instance, uh, the quarks only give you, you know, about you know, less than 2% of the mass of the proton. So if you add up the PDG masses of, of the quarks, they, they end up being less than 2%. And that's you know, much less than that, obviously, of that of the proton. The question is, you know, where does the missing mass come from? 
And it's clear it must come through the dynamical interactions of gluons with quarks and with, of gluons with each other, so they can have self-interactions of the sort here. And so, so even though gluons are massless, their dynamics is responsible for nearly all the mass of visible matter in the universe. And, and the Higgs particle, which was sort of the big you know, target discovery, is responsible for these, these quarks getting their masses, which is only about one to 2% of the proton mass. So gluons play, from that perspective alone, play a much bigger role in, in, the, in the structure of matter than, than, than the, uh, the quarks do through the Higgs mechanism. In fact, uh, this story is replete with irony, so you know, people, <laughs> some people get really upset when you use the word God particle because, you know, they, you know, because of this reason, because we, we all know that gluons really uh, really sort of what are responsible for the mass of matter. Uh, and so turning to this, ki this image of this kindly gentleman, Peter Higgs, the story is replete with ironies. When, when Higgs was sort of doing his work uh, to, uh, where, where, wherein he, dis he sort of invented the, the uh, Higgs boson, he was really looking for a way to understand the strong force. In fact, this is a nice quote. I don't know if some of you can see this at the bottom. This is from the New York Times a year after he won the Nobel Prize, where he says, uh, when he invented, where they say, when he invented his boson in 1964, he said, I wasn't sure it would be important. He explained at the time he thought, the thought was to solve a strong force. And in fact, uh, the Higgs, you know, to compound this irony, the Higgs is dominantly produced at the LSD from some of the fusion of blue ones, from the two colliding protons. So this is the dominant channel uh, for producing the Higgs. Uh, and so, so it's kind of, you see that the gluons are playing a role even in the discovery of the Higgs, which, which doesn't contain most of the mass, mass of matter. Now, what do we know about the gluons? So they have some really remarkable properties uh, which sort of characterize them. So in, 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 if you think about the, the scattering of, say, two quarks of each other, uh, whereby they exchange gluons, gluons being the force carriers that are exchanged between the quarks, so you can think of gluons as fluctuating into a pair of quarks and antiquarks, just like in QED, two electrons that were scattering would exchange a virtual photon, which would go into an electron-positron pair. Uh, and this would actually screen the force between, uh, between two, uh, the two quarks. Uh, while in QCD, you can have an additional inter-exchange where a gluon can fluctuate into a pair of gluons which is then sort of which recombined to be then absorbed by the other quark. And this self-interaction of gluons is a remarkable feature that they possess, uh, which is completely different from QED and completely changes the nature of the strong force. So what this does is that it, with, 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 with the screening, uh, the, the force gets actually weaker as you go to larger distances and, and, and between, say, two electrons, while with, with the gluon exchange is the other way around. And this is the, the, the coupling constant in QCD as a function of the momentum transfer exchange between the two quarks. And you see as you go to a larger momentum transfer, shorter distances, the force between two quarks gets weaker. So, so unlike in QED, where between two electrons, the force would get stronger, and then it would get sort of weaker as they go apart. This is the other way around. And it's this sort of additional self-interaction self of gluons which really causes the change in sign. Uh, of, of, the, uh, of the QCD equations, uh, which then lead to this coupling sort of be becoming smaller as, as you go to larger momentum transfers. And for this remarkable discovery, which is called asymptotic freedom, the interactions get weaker as you go to smaller, shorter distances or, or larger momentum transfers. Uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Gross, uh, Wilczek, and Pollitzer. Uh, so, so the self-interaction of color charge. The gluons carry a charge called color, which sort of allows them to self-interact. And this is fundamentally responsible for asymptotic freedom of quarks and gluons in QCD. So this is qualitatively different from QED, and it's all because of this gluon self-interaction. So gluons playing a big role. Now, uh, conversely, as, as you try and sort of stretch uh, quarks apart from each other, so here's a sort of cartoon of trying to pull apart two quarks. The, the force between two, two, two quarks becomes greater as you go to large distances. So what's plotted here is the potential between a quark and anti-quark pair as a function of the distance. And you see that it's at very short distances, it's like a QED potential. So it's uh, you know, 
know, it's, it's, it goes as the Coulomb, uh, it has a Coulomb-like nature, but then as you go to larger distances, the potential between these two guys grows. So this is from a lattice QCD calculation. I'll talk about shortly uh, more about the lattice, but, but you see that the, the, the potential grows. And so, so as, as quarks get to be a distance of about one Fermi apart from each other, so about 10 to the minus 15 meters, the force between them is so strong, it's on the order of 16, 16 ton weight. Okay, the distance is about one Fermi. And in fact, so based on this sort of simple picture, uh, you know, of asymptotic freedom and sort of very strong confinements of, 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 of quarks, what one can sort of think of, of quarks as being sort of held together by a gluon string, which, which is sort of when they're close to each other, they're very weakly interacting, so the, the string is loose. But then as it gets stretched apart, the string gets taut. Uh, and in fact, you know, so if you think of this, this the quark, anti-quark pairs having some kind of string tension, then the, the rotations of the string, like object, gives you a very intuitive picture of the, of, of, of mesons that one, one can have in the strong interaction. So if you think of mesons as quark anti quark pairs, which sort of quantum numbers, uh, which are related to the rotations of strings, so if you plot the angular momentum of these mesons as a function of the, the masses, which is related to the string tension, you see they lie in this sort of beautiful trajectories, which are linear trajectories, which you would expect from, from them being sort of uh, in, in a sort of taut, held together by a taut string. Now, in detail, this picture turns out to be, to be wrong. Uh, it's much more complex in, 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 in uh, the full theory of the strong interactions. But these kinds of patterns are really sort of remarkable and things that we would like to understand better. Now, this sort of quark and gluon confinement is, is, an, is explains something really mysterious, to why we don't see quarks and gluons in nature. So even though we, we think that they are the fundamental particles that make up a strong force, the fact that they are confined at these sort of short distances, that they are sort of very strongly interacting, um, it sort of explains, you know, why we, you know, gives you sort of an intuitive explanation of why we uh, don't see them as freely interacting particles. So to just summarize this part of the talk, you know, this, this is the essential mystery, which uh, we sort of get jaded about, but if you really sort of think deeply about it, it is still very mysterious. So, uh, that even though quarks and gluons are the fundamental fields in nature, uh, which sort of uh, which make up the, the strong interact, which which uh, experiences strong interactions, they are not visible. So quarks and gluons are not visible, and they're confined inside objects called mesons and baryons. Um, and all strongly interacting matter is therefore an emergent consequence of the many body dynamics of quarks and gluons. So somehow, all the phenomena that we see. Even though we can't see these fundamental objects, they are generated from, from mesons and uh, they're generated from quarks and gluons. And one obvious example that I mentioned is that mass uh, of matter comes from massless gluons and nearly massless quarks, right? So here you have fundamental objects which are either massless or nearly massless and they generate all, all the mass of, of the visible universe. There, there's an even more profound thing, which is that even though you know this seems very complex, there's a real elegance and simplicity to nature's strong force, like those radio trajectories that I just showed you on the previous slide, uh, that you see these beautiful patterns which we don't really fully understand where that comes from. Um, and so one should argue on this basis that this is such a profound mystery that understanding the origins of matter at the deepest level requires not just you know, one particular approach, but sort of a deep and varied knowledge of theory and experiment together to really understand the emergent dynamics of strong interactions. So this is sort of the essential mystery that we'd like to know more about. But we do know quite a bit, and what we know is, is truly remarkable. Uh, so this section, this act two of my talk is about quantum chromodynamics, which is the theory of the strong force, and its power and glory, which is really the appropriate phrase to describe this. But it didn't have an easy path. So here's sort of a lepidopteral metaphor uh, from uh, this uh, I, owes, is, I owe to a talk uh, by Jeffrey Mandula, which he uh, sort of delivered at the uh, retirement fest of my colleague, uh, Mike Kreutz, last year, where he sort of articulated how you know, we went from Gelman's classification of mesons and baryons uh, using his eightfold way 
uh, where, so that sort of came up with the idea of quarks, uh, to QCD as sort of a caterpillar egg sort of going through this very ugly sort of larvae, so you can read this um, material here, to sort of a chrysalis where these ideas about paraferred para neons and parastatistics sort of finally sort of crystallized into the idea that these things were possibly something genuine rather than a mathematical shorthand. Uh, and, and then finally QCD, the you know, quantum current dynamics, this sort of beautiful theory which uh, sort of explained a lot of these mysteries that, uh, that we were sort of confronted with in the 60s. Uh, and so what is this theory? Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it has been called uh, a newly perfect theory. Uh, and it, it is a fundamental theory of, uh, of where the, the fundamental fields are quarks and muons. And it's, it's nearly perfect because if you put the masses of that, that are given to us by the Higgs to zero in the QC Lagrangian, there's no scale. So there's no manifest scale. Everything is sort of completely emergent. And that, is, that theory is very rich in symmetries. Okay? Uh, so, so QCD has a, a color symmetry. Uh, which is a local gauge symmetry that's unbroken but confined. Uh, it has a global chiral symmetry. So if you put the masses of quarks uh, in, 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 in QCD to zero, then sort of left-handed quarks and right-handed quarks are rotated independently. So they're, they're chiral, they have handedness symmetry. Uh, and that's exact for massless quarks. Uh, it has uh, U1 symmetries. So this is, a, uh, so it's a, uh, unitary sort of symmetry and sort of baryon for an axial charge, uh, and, and especially for mass n equals zero, this is a feature. And, and the, the fields are scale invariant, again, for massless quarks and muons. Uh, and it also has the discrete charge parity and time reversal symmetries. Now, all of these, except the color uh, gauge symmetry, are broken by vacuum of quantum effects. So the vacuum in QCD is a highly non trivial object, and this, these effects really lead to a, a tremendous amount of emergent phenomena that we know really exist. They have been experimentally confirmed and measured. And so one can summarize this enormous richness of the theory by saying that inherent in QCD are the deepest aspects of relativistic quantum field theories. So confinement, asymptotic freedom, anomalies, you know, uh, being sort of structures that are symmetries of the vacuum but not that of the Lagrangian. And spontaneous symmetry uh, breaking, uh, spontaneous breaking Carl symmetry, these are all sort of embedded in QCD. And that is sort of its part of its beauty and its uh, elegance. Now, we know QCD is the correct theory uh, for, for, uh, for a number of reasons, but one very important reason is that its numerical realization uh, has led to really remarkable results. And that's uh, that field is called lattice QCD. It's a whole subfield of physics now. Uh, and here's a picture of one of its founders, uh, Kent Wilson, and he's holding an object which is called a telephone. So for some of the young people in the audience, and, and these are objects called computers. I mean, they were computers of that day. Uh, and so um, what Wilson and others showed is that uh, sort of QCD can be realized uh, by sort of putting it on a lattice. Uh, which acts as a, as a regulator for the theory. So the infinities in the theory, uh, which can be regulated by, by sort of putting the theory in the lattice, and it gives you a first principles numerical treatment of static properties of the theory. So you can ask, uh, compute, uh, you can ask questions about and compute masses, moments, and, and even sort of thermodynamics, the pressure uh, uh, and uh, entropy density and so on of matter. Uh, in, in the strong interactions using putting the whole theory in the lattice. So you have a Lagrangian of the theory, you can sort of put it in the lattice numerically and try and solve it. Now, that sounds simple uh, in principle, but it's really a formidable computational problem, which has led to developments in computing. So these problems are so cutting edge that, that you know, we have sort of seen great computational advances due to this challenging problem. And it's especially challenging for dynamical processes. So for static quantities like those I mentioned, lattice QCD is a, is a good, uh, provides a good algorithm. But when you want to really look at th study things like scattering, so if you want to have two protons scattering on each other, it's, it's extremely challenging to, to understand. So, uh, but nevertheless, uh, Q 
QCD is enormously successful. So that with and so this is from an article in Science. So it's all already seven years old. That with uh, you know with few inputs, uh, you can sort of do a very good job of predicting the mass spectral of mesons and baryons. So it's extremely good agreement to one to two percent, which again tells you that this this very non-perturbative, uh, very complex you know, uh, theory. Uh, you can put it on the lattice and get answers which are robust to this kind of precision. And, and the lattice theorists have gone even further. So this is a sort of a, a remarkable plot. So this, look at the scale. This is MEV scale. So the masses of mesons and baryons are on the closer to the GV scale. So these much smaller scales. Uh, and this is comparing the, the differences in the masses. So this delta N is the mass difference of the neutron and the proton. And these are mass differences of the heavier mesons. And so to get this right, you have to solve QED plus QED on the lattice. So you have to not only just put QED on the lattice, you have to also combine that with QED because the mass difference of the neutron and proton also depends on the electromagnetic force. And you get this with remarkable precision. Okay, so this is really a tour de force calculation. In fact, if, if this difference were slightly slightly more than the 0.014%, if the neutron and proton had a slightly different mass difference, the universe would be a very different place. We wouldn't exist, and, and all, of, uh, uh, all of matter would, uh, would have a very different nature than, than, than what uh, one sees. So this is really extremely impressive. That it really tells us that this is the power and the glory of, of, of the lattice. Now, moving on. So this is my most technical slide, so please bear with me. Um, one of the great successes of QCD has been what we've learned with very high precision experiments which probe the structure of matter uh, using electron beams. So this is our, our, our lepton beams. Uh, so it can be electron muon beams, uh, which really probe deeply inside the, the structure of the proton. So that hence the word deeply elastic scattering. And femtoscope means scales below 10 to the minus 15 meters, so one fermion. So uh, in this sort of par paradigmatic experiment, you have an electron coming in, which scatters at some angle. It, it exchanges a virtual photon, which then breaks up the proton of the nucleus, which then goes into some fragments. And this scattering, you can write down the cross-section for that in terms of certain invariants, which don't depend on the reference frame in which you did the scattering. So whether it's in the rest frame of the target or in sort of in the center of mass frame, you can, you can characterize this very simple cross-section, the electron hits a proton or hadron, goes into an electron and, and, and all kinds of junk. You could write that in terms of the following invariance. So Q squared is the resolution power. So it's, it's four times the electron, incoming electron energy times the outgoing electron energy times the sine squared of theta over two, where theta is, is the, the scattered angle from the beam. Uh, and then there's a elasticity variable, which really depends on energy loss of the, uh, of the, of the electron. Uh, and, and then there's the variable x, which is q squared over the, the Lorentz invariant p dot q, where p is a form momentum of the proton, and q is a form momentum carried by the virtual proton. And that's a measure of the momentum fraction of the total momentum of the proton that's carried by the struck object in here. Okay, So this is the uh, one thing to keep in mind. And x and q squared are related through the energy of the scattering. So S is the energy squared of the scattering. So small x and fixed Q squared means very high energy. So, so keep that in mind. That'd be great. And I'll come back to it later. So this cross section for this simple scattering is has this overall fact factor, which is the Rutherford cross section. So this is like QED of the electron scattering of some point like object inside the proton. So that goes as one over the momentum resolution to the fourth power. Uh, and it has the QED coupling, so it's the, it's the electromagnetic coupling, times these, stuff, these objects called structure functions, which tell you about the structure of the stuff inside the proton. And this object F2, which is a function of both x and q squared, measures quark and antiquark momentum distributions, while the structure FL is directly sensitive to the amount of gluons, it's the number of gluons inside, inside the proton. So, these are, so this is my most technical slide. Um, and so when people first did these deeply inelastic scattering experiments at SLAC in the late 60s, 
they encountered a tremendous surprise. And, and the surprise was the following. So people thought the strong interactions were truly strong. So if you, if you had a virtual photon scattering of this, they would think that you would see some strongly interacting objects. However, when they plotted the structure function that I wrote here, which is in principle a function of x and q squared, so x being the momentum fraction carried by this object, q squared being the resolution power, they found that it only depended on, on this variable x. And it was in this wide range in q squared, well, wide, as you'll see, is, a, is, is in the eye of the beholder. But in this range in q squared, you see that this, this f2 just depends on this function of x. It didn't care about what the resolution power of the probe was. So that's usually the case when you have stuff that's not interacting. So if stuff is not interacting and you vary the resolution power, you're just going to see you know, what this, these point-like objects. And so it told you that the stuff inside the proton was weakly interacting. So here we have a period of strong interactions. We're trying to understand the strongly interacting stuff. But then it looked like the stuff was weakly interacting. So that was a big, big surprise. Uh, and this discovery of this point-like non-interacting objects, which people call partons, um, won the Nobel Prize for Friedman, Kendall, and, and Taylor, who were instrumental in, in, this, in this discovery at, at Slack. So, so what's going on here, right? And so here's our modern picture uh, of, of deep elastic scattering. So this is data from HERA. And the Slack experimental data that I showed you previously in this slide, that's this little corner here. Okay. And so, so that's, so this is data from HERA. It's, it has spans five orders of magnitude in the resolution. So it goes from one GV squared to 10 to the five GV squared. And then in X, it goes from momentum fractions where a quark carries about 70% of the momentum of the proton to momentum fractions where a quark is carrying one, in, one part in 10 to the five or so. Uh, well, it's actually six times 10 to the minus five is the lowest x that, that is measured, as shown here in this plot. So a huge range of the structure function measured in x and q squared. And this tells an interesting story because what you see is that the slack experiments suggested that these were sort of non-interacting, sort of quasi-free parton objects inside the proton. But we know that QCD exists. It's a theory in hindsight that it's a theory of strong fraction. So you can have gluon exchanges like this. Or you can have a gluon being emitted by one of the valence partons, which then goes into a quark into a quark pair, so-called C quarks, which can then be probed by the virtual photon. So the number of objects inside the proton can multiply as you go to higher and higher energies or smaller and smaller x. So when you see a lot of stuff, that, that causes the cross-section to grow. Because remember, the cross-section was directly proportional to, to this F2 here. So, so this is just saying there's more stuff in here. Okay? And that's why this stuff is growing as you go to higher Q squared and smaller x. So from this kind of stuff, you could extract information about just the number of quarks and gluons inside, inside the proton. So these are so-called parton distribution functions. And you see that the number of, the, this is a proton. It's no longer just three quarks, but it's a very complex many-body object which is made up of lots of gluons. So this is the gluon distribution as a function of momentum fraction inside the proton. And you see that the, the valence quarks are sort of very, very small when you go to high energies. And the proton really looks like a gluon dominated object. It's, it's, you know, this is a logarithmic scale. And you see that gluons and C quarks completely dominate the, the structure of the proton. So at very high energies, the take away message is when you probe with a, micro, with a femtoscope the structure of the proton, it looks like a very sort of dense many-body object that's got dominated by gluons. So this perturbative QCD DIS paradigm is now sort of the benchmark for new physics. So one can, and it's part, what illustrates this remarkable power is, is that you can take these structure functions that are measured in deep elastic scattering experiments at HERA, so, so electron scattering of the proton, you can take that information about the structure of the proton and then collide two protons together and then look at what the distribution of jets is. So these are jet cross sections from RIC, the Tevatron, and LC, spanning nearly two orders of magnitude in energy and over several decades in the momentum of the outgoing jets. So this is jets going up to you know, almost 1,000 TeV. Over 11 orders of magnitude in the jet cross sections, you see a beautiful agreement with data. <coughs> so this relies 
this agreement relies very much on asymptotic freedom that I mentioned earlier, that at short distances, the self-coupling of gluons makes the interactions of quarks weaker. And this is a remarkable illustration of the power and glory of, of QCD. So you can say, ah, so the study of strong interactions is now uh, a mature subject. So this is, here is a quote from Frank Wilczek, uh, which he gave at Quark Matter, uh, a major conference in my field uh, last year. And so let me just read this. He said, the study of strong interactions is now a mature subject. We have a theory of the fundamentals, QCD, quantum chromodynamics, that's correct and complete. And all these asterisks refer to various sort of you know, fine-tuning caveats. Uh, and he goes on to then say, in this sense, it's akin to atomic physics, condensed matter physics, or chemistry. Important questions involve emergent phenomena and applications. Now, if you had asked, you know, are we done based on this enormous, beautiful agreement data, that would mean that you don't need atomic physics or condensed matter physics or, or chemistry and physics departments, and you empty them very quickly. And that would be silly because you know these questions are extremely important and fundamental, but they're not quest questions about the, the, the structure of the, the, the theory itself, but you know the emergent phenomena that appear once you have such, such a theory that you can write down. Um, and so this is Act Three, um, is what we don't know. Okay, so I mentioned uh, you know that we have this great mystery, which is you know how is what is the structure of matter at the deepest level, and how how are the phenomena we <coughs> see generated? And I talked about you know the impressive things that we know, and now let me go to what we really don't know, and that's a lot. So here's a, a, a sort of cartoon of the energy uh, that you sort of probe. Uh, it's sort of, sort of probing matter at higher and higher energies and strong interactions as a function of the momentum resolution on the x-axis here. So you go to high energies and look sort of at short and shorter distances. Now at very high momentum resolutions, uh, you see quarks and gluons. So we, we understand uh, uh, sort of the, the how to compute things. We, the theory works very well. So that was the perturbative you see that I mentioned. The asymptotic freedom <coughs> works very well. So we understand physics here. Um, and then there's not much else. I mean, so at very sort of low energies and low momenta, we have car perturbation theory, which we believe to be a realization of QCD. And that works fairly well. But then the rest, we just have models. Okay? So if you are at low momentum resolutions and go to very high energies, you know, there's been lots of phenological work involving objects called pomerons and regions and so on, but we don't really have sort of a direct connection of that to the fundamental theory. Uh, and so there's a huge gap in terms of what we really do know okay, about the strong interactions when it comes to scattering. Uh, and so this region that we know very well is a very small part of the total cross-section in scattering. So most of the stuff that we see uh, is not described by, by perturbative QCD. And the lattice is of very limited help in understanding scattering, as I mentioned previously, because it only deals with static quantities. And so one is then forced to sort of restrict oneself to effective field theories, uh, which capture sort of the fundamental features of the theory, but may involve other effective degrees of freedom than quarks and gluons. And that's a very interesting question, is how do quark and gluon degrees of freedom organize themselves to describe the bulk of the cross section? And, and to illustrate you know, uh, 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 an issue which immediately sort of uh, exposes our ignorance is if, if anyone were to ask you, what does a proton look like, right? Uh, we really would be at a loss. So this is such an elementary question that you know, a high school student or just anyone, a uh, person on the street could ask you, you know, what does it really look like in terms of quarks and gluons? And you don't really know. So here are some pictures. Uh, that people have had. So there's the famous bag model, where you think of these three quarks surrounded by this sort of field of blue and confined inside a bag. Um, and then there are models like the constituent quark model, where you think of the gluons as being sort of somehow a cloud around each of these valence quarks. Uh, or you have pictures from the lattice with sort of heavy quarks, which form a baryon, where the gluons are sort of inside the, the quarks. Okay, so they're more concentrated in this white kind of shape. And further, you can ask, well, what happens if you boost this picture? So this is how a proton looks like at rest. What happens if the proton's moving very fast? 
And you could maybe get it in just like any of these things here. So we don't really understand you know, where the, what the gluon radius of the proton is. Is it larger than the, the quark radius? Is it smaller? Uh, or is it sort of comparable? Okay, so these are sort of elementary questions that we don't really fully have answers to. Now, um, to sort of take this to sort of its extreme relief, so let's sort of think about what happens when you boost a proton. So imagine that you have these three valid quarks that are going along. And in, in QCD, because it's a quantum field theory, you can have these kinds of vacuum fluctuations where gluons can address the proton and they fluctuate in and out of existence like you know, little fireflies. Now, if you boost the proton and you go from low energies to high energies, so from large x fractions to small x fractions, what happens is time dilation starts to play a role and these, these fluctuations begin to last longer and longer and they get time dilated. Now, if on the time scale of the sort of long life of these fluctuations, if you hit it with a probe, right, you're going to see a lot more gluons. So these sort of weak partons, which sort of fluctuate, you know, these are partons carrying a very small fraction of proton momentum, and sort of, which are fluctuating in and out of vacuum, uh, sort of at, at sort of in, at in the static proton, and they boost it, so they live longer and longer, and they produce more and more gluons. And this explains this plot that you saw that I showed previously, where the gluon distributions grow. And that's telling you that as you go to higher and higher energies, these fluctuations, which are things that dress the proton wave function, they actually get sort of dilated enough that you start to measure them. Okay, so these are sort of telling you that you have time dilated gluons which you can actually measure at some resolution. So what happens? Does this keep on going forever? I mean, when does this stop? Okay, is a proton a sort of a runaway popcorn machine? So you sort of start piling these gluons more and more, and at some point there's a lid pop. So what is it that's keeping the protons sort of intact? And so this leads to sort of some new ideas. Uh, and, and one of these is to suggest that one way this problem is resolved is that if you imagine that you have the proton with these gluons of a certain size, so imagine the gluons and quarks inside the proton of a certain thick size, and then you boost it. So if you imagine I'm a photon, and the proton's coming at me very rapidly, then the number of these, these gluons start to radiate more and more and more gluons. So, so I see more and more of these gluons. And so at some point, these gluons start to be, sort of overlap with each other. So they're initially sort of separated. But at some point, there are so many of them that they start to overlap in their transverse plane. And, and the repulsive interactions between these self-interacting gluons get to be so large that they, they sort of start to repel each other. So there's a competition at some point between the gluons wanting to emit more and more gluons, and then once you produce enough of these soft gluons, they're starting to self-interact and repel each other. Now this wouldn't happen in QED where the photons don't interact versus approximation. So this, this dynamical feature, so this is an emergent phenomena where you know, this, this sort of competition between sort of the bremsstrahlum of more gluons and their repulsive interactions generates a scale that's a kind of close packing scale called a saturation scale. And that starts to, at high energies, control the, the dynamics. So this is the radial limit of QCD, uh, which has been known for a very, very long time. But this understanding of that in terms of QCD suggests that you generate a semi-hard scale. So as you go to high energies or high resolutions, this scale sort of grows. So imagine you're at some very high resolution and you start to increase the energy. It becomes denser and denser. And at some density, the close packing sets in. Uh, and that's true for any such sort of resolution scale that you increase the energy of. So how does this happen? What are the right degrees of freedom? How do correlation functions of these sort of many body interactions evolve? So this is like condensed matter physics. So you have this two dimensional plane of sort of strongly interacting gluons and what controls their dynamics, right? Is there some kind of a fixed point for this renormalization group evolution? How does the coupling run? So if you are in a regime where QS, the saturation scale is larger than the resolution scale, does it run with QS? Okay. And how does all this transition to Carl symmetry breaking and confinement? So these sort of, sort of, there's lots of interesting questions in terms of how sort of the proton, this humble object, you know, with three balance quarks in the extreme situations, behaves like this complex many body uh, in a system of quarks and gluons. Now in nuclei, this sort of brings in another factor, because you imagine now a nucleus being boosted instead of the proton, 
then if you're a photon and you see the nucleus coming at you at very high energies, you're not just seeing the quarks and gluons from, say, the first nucleon. You're seeing them from nucleons all along sort of the path that you're sort of, you're, you're sort of interacting with, the nucleons. So the, there's, a, there's an enhancement proportional to this sort of nuclear radius, which goes as 8 to the 1 third. So this effective scale, which gives you this tremendous oomph, uh, is, is, is enhanced by 8 to the 1 third. So the close packing scale, in terms of what a virtual photon sees, is much larger in the nucleus than the proton. So this regime of very strongly interacting. So this is when saturation scale is large, when you're looking at modes which are sensitive to that scale, you're seeing very strongly interacting fields, even though the scale is a weak coupling scale. So you have a new regime in QCD where it's not just like weakly coupled gas of quarks and gluons or truly confined strong fields, which you can't describe in terms of partons, but you have this new regime, this so-called colored glass condensate, where you can try and study the interactions, uh, which is very non-perturbative, but can use weak coupling methods. And so the question is, can one use the opening up of this new scale with nuclei and with high energies to understand this confining dynamics, this essential mystery sort of speak through the back door. Okay, so this is an interesting question that we would like to understand. Now, um, there's also several other important puzzles that we don't understand. So all of us know that the proton has a spin half, so that's been uh, confirmed uh, sort of and, and sort of used uh, uh, you know, uh, over, over many, many decades. And so the question is, how do quarks and gluons, so this is not a simple question you can ask. So one question was, what does a proton look like? And the other is that we all know that the proton is a spin hat. How do quarks and gluons make up the spin of the proton? So if you understood that they were three quarks, you could say, well, you know, each of these quarks is spin half. So, so you do the vector sum, and you will get, you will get a half. Now, in the 80s, there were deep elastic scattering experiments of polarized targets, which showed actually that Quarks only carry about 30% of the proton spin. Okay, so they don't carry you know, the full amount, they carry only 30%. And so this led to a so-called spin crisis. So this is a failure of this fourth model picture of just, just three quarks as describing the spin of the proton. So now what could it be? Could it be the gluons? Now there's also the orbital motion of quarks and gluons. And so somehow these must add up to give you one half. So because we believe, of course, this to be true. But the question of how this happens is, is still extremely mysterious, even though, like I was saying, this is a very simple number. So how does this very complex many-body theory with all this emergent phenomena generate such a simple number? Okay. Now, this, there were experiments over the last decade and a half at Rick uh, where he co collided on polarized protons and polarized protons. And, and there was clear evidence seen for polarization of gluons. So we know that not only are quarks polarized, but gluons are polarized too. But, but the, the answer is still ambiguous because, if, so here's the gluon distribution integrated up to some x, which is the limit of what we know at Rick. And, and however, if you extrapolate to even smaller x, that leads to tremendous uncertainties in what the actual gluon distribution of the proton is. So that the integral of this is what is the, the spin carried by gluons. And you can see that even though up to some range measured by Rick, it suggests that things are positive, that's this red dot here. When you go to lower, uh, to higher energies, there's a much larger uncertainty that we need to understand. So, so we still need to know where's the rest. Now we can also, so the questions that we've asked so far, experimentally, are mostly about the one dimensional momentum distributions of protons. We don't know hardly anything about you know, what the momentum of quarks and gluons is in the proton, and especially if the quarks and gluons are polarized. So you can ask questions like, what happens if you have an unpolarized quark inside a polarized proton? And by looking at differences between these, sometimes called the Sivers function, you can learn a lot about the correlations of spin of quarks uh, and, and that of their momenta inside a proton. You can also measure things. These are so-called transverse momentum-dependent distributions. You can also look at things like where you have an electron coming in and you measure a, a photon in coincidence with a proton that's going out, and that tells you something about the spatial structure of quarks and gluons inside a proton. So we don't know anything about the spatial structure of quarks and gluons. So such differential Im images correlating the spin, momentum, and spatial distributions can really provide sort of fundamental insight into quark-gluon dynamics. And 
about nuclei, we know hardly anything about the quark undergoing distribution of the nuclei. So here's a cartoon which shows you that the ratio of the quark undergoing distribution to the nucleus relative to the proton normalized by the number of the, the atomic number. And you see that there's all this interesting structure in there. Uh, what that tells us is that quarks and gluons are not simple superpositions of, of just simple you know, quark and gluon distributions inside the proton. It's much more complex, but there's very little that we know. So one can think of the nucleus as a kind of laboratory for QCD. So just like in condensed matter physics, we have various materials that one can use to study how sort of electron and protons create very complex emergent phenomena. Similarly, the nucleus is a QCD laboratory where you can understand things like what happens if quarks and gluons fragment inside or outside the nucleus as they sort of, uh, tra sort of traverse the nucleus. And that tells us something about confinement. How do quarks and gluons form hadrons? So finally, uh, let me sort of mention the, the machine that could sort of address all these questions. And that's the electron ion collider. Uh, which has really several unique features. It will be the world's first polarized electron polarized proton collider. It will be the world's first electron heavy ion collider. And it will have unparalleled intensity. So it will have luminosities at least 100 times and uh, up to 1,000 times that of the previous such collider, HERA. And it will also, just like HERA, have very fine resolution inside the proton down to about a thousandth of a pentometer. So this is really a remarkable machine it realized. And if it's built in the United States, it will be the only collider in the United States at that time. Okay, so this is really, uh, so in terms of accelerator technology, it has, it has tremendous value. There are two such machines. So one is ERIC at Brookhaven, uh, where, you know, so Brookhaven, uh, RIC has, does ion-ion collisions and proton-proton polarized collisions. So this would involve adding an electron ring to, to the, the RIC facility. Uh, and see here are some of the specs. You can go up to very high energies of electrons, 21 GeV. Uh, ions up to 100 GeV, protons up to 250. And then there's a similar uh, sort of, uh, there's a, a somewhat different concept, sorry, at, at JLab, where they have an existing electron beam, and they would add a sort of proton ring to the facility. Uh, and it has sort of a unique configuration, and the electrons would, of course, be up to 12 GeV, with ions with somewhat lower energies, but their, their requirement is somewhat greater luminosities than that of, 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 uh, of RIC. And as I mentioned briefly, there's also this concept at, LH, at CERN, which would go to much higher energies than HERA, but would not have polarization. So here's uh, a few select measurements. Um, and so if you want more details, you can look at this, uh, this white paper here, which is on the, on the web. And so with regard to the proton spin puzzle, so what can the EIC do? So you can measure the polarized structure functions of the proton. So this is the world data, what we know, in X and Q squared. And this is what EIC will, will tell us. Okay, and the yellow bands are extrapolations from what we know, and you see the errors are very large. And so by doing deep plastic scattering experiments where you have electron scattering of pol protons polarized along the beam direction or against the beam direction, you can extract this G1 structure function. And from that, you can, you can, you can measure this, this gluon sp spin variable, delta G, as a function of x. And you see there's a dramatic reduction in uncertainties. And if you do that, you can, you can sort of plot here the, the, the spin content of the, uh, the carried by the gluons inside the proton versus that carried by the quarks, the valence quarks. And this is the current uncertainty, okay? So we hardly know anything, right? And this is what EIC would do, okay? So it would reduce this uncertainty to this tremendous precision. So really nail down the valence C quark and gluon contributions to the proton spin. And so by doing so, you would also nail down the the, because there's a spin sum rule, right? It has to be one half. You would also significantly quantify the orbital contribution. So this is the tremendous uncertainty as function of x, and you see that's really reduced to this very very small value. If you subtract out the the uh, valence distributions, you can do remarkable imaging experiments where you do semi-inclusive reactions where you measure the electron in coincidence with, say, a pion or other hadrons. And so this is something called a Sivers function that one can extract in such experiments, which tells you something about polarized quarks inside the unpolarized 
uh, sorry, un unpolarized quarks inside a polarized proton. And, and this is the world's sort of current understanding of this as a function of this is momentum, it should be. Uh, sorry, as a function of x, and you see this is this tremendous reduction in, in uncertainties. And you can construct such 3D images. So it, not only would you know as a function of x, just one dimensional uh, distributions, but you'll have momentum as well. So you'll have two plus one dimensional distributions, and you can sort of construct these very pretty images of the momentum space of where the strength of, of distribu this distribution of, say, an up fork versus a down fork looks like. Okay, so you can construct such really differential distributions of how momentum uh, and spin are correlated inside the proton. Okay, you can do similar things spatially through these generalized parton distributions. And you can look at how, again, 2 plus 1D images, so this is X, this is in transverse momentum. So you can look at, say, what's the likelihood of having a quark and a gluon at some distance away from the center of the proton. And you can start to really look closely at the tails of these distributions and the insight that they would give into, say, confinement. So, so you can do high precision spatial tomography. So these are actual projections based on simulations in terms of what you can do in nuclei. So here's the current uncertainty in the nuclear gluon distributions of gluon, C quarks, and valence. Look at the large sort of uncertainties here. With EIC, you're sort of really reducing this tremendously. Okay? So you have a dramatic improvement in precision extraction of nuclear gluons and C quarks. Also to understand hybridization, and well, I'm finishing up. Uh, you can sort of ask very detailed questions about you know, where uh, quarks and gluons fragment. Do they fragment inside the nucleus and then sort of form a hadron or can we sort of, and you can dial that. You can dial that by varying a variable called mu uh, and looking at ratios of distributions and, and that's really going to tell you a lot about hadronization of heavy quarks as shown here versus light quarks. So um, this is my last uh, topic. Uh, it's, you can do really remarkable things with diffraction. So in diffraction, it's just like in, in optics, you can think of the electron going into, into a collection of wave packets, which can have either just an electron or a virtual photon or a quark anti quark pair, and a quark anti quark pair. So you can think of these different quark gluon wave packets sort of coming and fragmenting around, forming these patterns around this proton, telling you from these patterns what the structure of the proton is. And one of the predictions is, for instance, that if a TV scale electron hits a proton at rest, right, which has a binding energy of 8 mEV per nucleon, a day one prediction in some models right, is that the nucleus will remain intact in at least one in five events. Okay. And you can distinguish between models where you have gluon saturation, you know, this very dense packed uh, sort of uh, system of gluons, versus those without very cleanly using diffractive measurements. So let me jump ahead so I don't have time to talk about this last topic. So here's my concluding thoughts. Um, so as I mentioned, there's an essential mystery about the structure of matter. And that's clouded by this vast fog of our ignorance. I hope I illustrated that how little do we know even though we have the right theory. There are bright gems that shine through. So we know that quantum chromodynamics is the right theory. And at the heart of the matter is the confining dynamics of QCD. We don't understand and how these fundamental fields you know, can be seen, how they generate all this emergent phenomena. And that's fundamentally many body physics. Okay? So, condensed matter physicists in the audience should, should sort of resonate with that. Uh, and so, it's very different from sort of this quest in particle physics where it's just sort of reductionist, but it's more sort of trying to understand uh, you know, how sort of complex phenomena you know, sort of emerge from simple elements. And addressing this requires deep and varied knowledge, as I've argued. And the IC enables unique and unprecedented measurements, so it's really a fantastic machine. And the history of deep plastic scattering informs us that all of what I said may be completely wrong, and maybe sort of new things that one discovers, uh, and uh, that sh certainly should be anticipated. So thank you very much. So this is uh, the main issue of uh, Scientific American. So if you go to your nearest uh, Sort of, uh, so it's it's uh, it's mainly about dinosaurs, but we have a feature article <laughs> there that says how do gluons bind matter? Hope, hope it doesn't end up like the dinosaurs. Uh, and uh, so I'll end with this. So this is the article, so you can take a look. Uh, it's for a popular audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. So are there any comments, questions? 
Yes. Um, regarding the color glass condensate, um, I am, um, in my mind, I am kind of having trouble reconciling this with basic relativistic principles. If, if um, there's at lower values of x, we have more. Or the, or the theory, the, the, the color glass condensate theory goes that there's um, that there's more gluons. The number of gluons increase at low. Well, I mean, we are seeing the more gluons at lower x. Um, what I'm having trouble dealing with, though, is how do we reconcile that with basic relativistic principles? Um, what, what relativistic principle are we violating? Well, if I was if I was in the same if I was in the rest frame of the nucleus, um, would I see more would I see more of them there too? The, the answer is, is no, because you, I mean, as I said, you, so quantum field theory tells you that you have these quantum fluctuations which dress the the uh, Say the valence quarks that you saw that Im image that I showed, yes. and that that by construction is completely consistent with relativity and quantum mechanics. Right? It's a quantum field theory. Okay. And what happens is that if if if, if then it depends on the frame in which you observe it. So now if you boost the the proton, what happens is that there's time dilation, which is relativistic a relativistic principle, right? That tells you that these fluctuations are getting dilated with respect to being observed by an observer, right? And so then okay. if you have high enough resolution, you can actually look at the structure of these fluctuations. Okay. That's what you're learning. So it's, it's in fact, it is a prediction of relativity, which would not be there if that weren't true. Okay. Okay, so it's, right. it's, it's essential that relativity hold for this. Okay. Lesson. All right, thanks. Okay. Any other comment questions? For the Ulrich and J Lab, Alternatives, would both facilities be able to address all of the physics that you have laid out here? So that's a very interesting question. So both communities have signed onto a white paper where there's a common set of, of uh, energies, so, so straw, straw man, straw man energies, uh, and luminosities. Uh, which they would both like to achieve, and they have looked at the science case, which is available and feasible with, with those energies. Um, now, of course, um, the focus of each community is slightly different. Um, you know, so the folks at JLab, just because of their history, the are kind of interested in more imaging type issues, generalized particle distributions that I mentioned, which are very, are very luminosity hungry. The, the, the Rick folks are more interested in color glass condensate, understanding you know, very dense uh, uh, gluon states, uh, just because they form the initial conditions for the ion collision, so that's a natural interest. And that is less luminosity hungry, but more energy hungry. So you need to go to higher energies to really see, see that stuff. So, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain tension there, but I think they are not mutually exclusive because even if you saw, say, dense gluon states, you want to image them. You want to understand where spatially the gluon sit. So I think um, you know this is this tension, however, is going to be driving a lot of the future discussions in terms of which facility gets selected. And that will ultimately depend on what the technological developments are in terms of accelerator R&D at both facilities. So if Rick, for instance, shows that with their technology they can go to 234, that's, that's great, and they can do imaging. Um, uh, or if JLab shows that without significant uh, increase in cost, they can go to higher energies, they can also go to small accelerators. So, so I think it's really going to be driven by accelerator R&D going ahead in the next few years. <coughs> But yes. You mentioned the proton neutron mass difference. Right. And uh, I was wondering if you'd like to enlarge on that. So, as we know, if you have a, a line structure constant, which gives electromagnetic contribution, you have a Higgs uh, current quark mass contribution of a given size, which is determined by the Higgs and Kawa coupling. Right. You have a strong coupling contribution. All these things conspire, right, so that we have nuclei in this universe, right? Uh, can you tie that to the anthropic principle in your paper? 
And so, they could glue on the hero of this present <laughs> so, 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 yeah, so thank you for that. So it's I should, it's I should. It's the main explanation, right? Yeah, so I should hasten to admit that I'm not an author of this paper. So these are lattice cage theorists. I'm not a lattice cage theorist. So this is a paper from the BMW collaboration, Fodor and company. And they so have. We don't, need, we don't need the lattice people to know. No, I understand. So, 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 so to, but to address a specific question, yes, indeed, they have. Uh, they have really tied this into the entropic arguments. Because, for instance, I mean, if the proton neutron mass difference were less than 0.14, let's say they were 0.05, there would be very specific consequences, right? So you would have inverse beta decay and so on, and, and uh, you would produce an helium in the universe and that sort of thing. So, so it has very definite consequences. And that comes from the from QCD. I don't know if that addressed your. I just want to make sure you can keep that strong voice going. <laughs> yes. No, I, so I think that there's also a paper by Bob Jaffe and collaborators that addressed exactly these issues. And it, it sort of the, the masses of the quarks were slightly different. Um, you know, what would be some of the consequences if, uh, if uh, QCD was not the way it was? You know, what, I mean, it's, it, the consequences are tremendous. But this, this paper is remarkable because it's really the the most quantitative examination of that question today. So, there any comments? Um, well, I just want to make a comment. So, we're happy that we're very happy that you're here. Um, and you know, he's the, the group leader that we have at, at the group, at the Open Theory Group at BNL. And uh, <laughs> yes, and and so is um, and, and so you're he's very involved from in these developments for the electron collider. And you've been. Can you tell us more about what do you see the you know um, the future of this project? Do you see this? Uh, are you positive about it? I yeah, think you're yeah. positive because you're here. But yeah, so, so positive you're yeah, so, so I think what uh, Daniel is trying to get out of me is that so I was uh, on the uh, so so DOE has a committee called NSAC, which is a nuclear science advisory committee, and I'm on this committee, and uh, and there's a larger subcommittee about 60 people, and, and last week we had a meeting in Kitty Hawk. And Carolina uh, to decide the future, decide the future of nuclear physics. Just like P5 is for for the high energy physicists, you know this. And uh, we um, we came up with a set of targeted recommendations. Uh, and uh, so this, these are embargoed and detailed until until our final NSAC meeting where we vote uh, to accept it. But uh, I can say that the electron ion collider is is the is the highest priority for new construction in nuclear physics. Uh, after the completion of FBRIC, which is the, uh, the fixed target low energy machine at uh, MSU. So, so I think uh, one can be very optimistic about uh, this machine in the United States. Now, to uh, address uh, also Steve's question, we don't know where this will be located. It could be either JLab or Bouquet, but that depends on the accelerator development over the next few years. There'll be significant investment in that, so that's one of our recommendations as well. Uh, and so hopefully, um, so I think for some of the young people in the audience, I hope that this will be sort of an attractive uh, possibility to consider in the, in the near future. Um, so, so nuclear physics is really thriving in the United States. It's uh, one of the fields in which we can really have uh, world leadership and dominance. Uh, as I mentioned, the VIC is built to be the only collider in the United States in that time frame. So I think, uh, I hope we can maintain this world leadership. Thank, thanks a lot for your visit.
Okay. Do we um, what does the data say about that? Do we have do we have data that's that? Yes. Well, so this is 